All right, everybody, welcome back to another episode of the Lasting Learning Podcast. Whether you are here on accident or on purpose, I am glad you found us because today we have another absolutely incredible guest joining us. We've got a woman here who is truly a jack of all trades. She is just absolutely incredible. She's changing the world for her kids and kids all over the world, even in Alaska. She's the person that I follow online and I just, I smile every single time I read something. I laugh an awful lot, sometimes even with a guilty little chuckle because some of the stuff she says is just amazing. Um, but she is absolutely incredible. And I am so glad that we have Melody McAllister here with us today. Melody, thanks for joining us. Hey, Dr. Dave, thank you so much for having me today. I really do feel honored to be a part of this. And I, I, I'm now, I subscribe to your podcast. So I love learning from you and your guests here. Um, so yeah, my name is Melody McAllister. I taught all my years of public school teaching in Texas. Um, my husband and I moved to Alaska in Eagle River, Alaska about seven months ago. We have five kids. Uh, I pulled every, so I pulled my oldest three out of public school so that we could homeschool this year just because we had kind of a crazy last few years. And so um, that was one of the reasons why we moved to Alaska was just to kind of regroup together as a family and get, um, kind of get to know each other again. And so, so I'm also the logistics manager for EduMatch Publishing. I have a book that's called The I'm Sorry Story that will be coming out this January. So I'm really excited. Wow. I have a life that I thought was busy. You know, I've got right. of my <laughs> own and um, I feel like I am always spinning like a top. I can't even imagine <laughs> living the life that you live right now. You said you went from Texas to Alaska. Talk about a transition. I just went from Florida to Michigan and I thought that was like the end of the world. You, you trumped it. You said, that, that's all you got? <laughs> I'm going to one-up you. <laughs> you went all the way to Alaska. You said, Eagle River, where in the world is Eagle, like, not like it matters, but where's Eagle River, Alaska in comparison? So to Eagle River, right. So Anchorage, we're about 10 minutes outside of Anchorage. Okay. And it, we've actually, I've learned that Eagle River is the number one place to live in Alaska. Um, uh -huh. Although we live in a tiny little place right now because the the cost of living is tremendous, even more than we had planned for. So yeah, this move was absolutely, we thought, hey, let's give our family an adventure that we would never otherwise be able to do. And so when my husband got offered this job to take him here, that's what we, we just thought, let's do it. Let's do something. Let's get out of the daily grind. And also the pace of living is very slow. Like sometimes I feel technology is like 10, 15 years behind what we're used to. Well, that's because it's nighttime all the time there, isn't it? No, actually, the summer is so, the days are so long in the summer. I mean, they're like over 20 hours. Wow. It is so hard to sleep. I don't think I slept hardly at all this summer, even with blackout curtains. And we're getting darker days right now. The length of days is probably about as much as yours, but okay. they are getting, every day they get like five minutes, you know, darker. Okay. So, yeah. Uh, and, and, and five kids. What are their ages? Right. So uh, my youngest and my oldest actually have the same birthday. So they are nine years apart, but it goes uh, 10, eight, six, who's about to be seven, five, and then almost two, one. Mm -hmm. Good, yeah. God almighty. That is impressive. Right. And you're homeschooling. <laughs> See, so I, I've, you know, I've done my fair share of teaching. I was a classroom teacher <laughs> for seven years and done the principal thing and all that. And a class of 30 strangers kids is one thing. Five of your own kids takes it to a whole nother level. Because your own kids can get under your skin like a stranger's kids never can. <laughs> so, yes. And homeschooling with that wide variety of, of uh, needs. Talk about differentiation in your own house. How does that even work? Well, okay, so I haven't found my, like, I'm not, I'm not completely great at it. I'm not actually in any way, shape, or form great at it. But right now, my whole focus is just to have a relaxed atmosphere, just kind of think outside of the box. And my oldest, I think that she was, the whole testing thing in Texas is just completely out of hand. And she used to love school. She used to love learning. I mean, just math was her thing. And that just was totally destroyed in these last few years. And I'm not trying to make anybody feel badly or say that the Texas school system is crap. Um, but there is a lot of like expectation for the older, you know, once you start testing. And I have just watched her like decline in her interest in anything. 
And so that was another reason why I really wanted to homeschool because, you know, I taught fifth grade for many years and if I can teach everybody else's kids, but I can't reach my own, what does it matter? Mm -hmm. And I could tell that she had a lot of gaps, especially in math. That's probably what really scared me. She wasn't making the connections that she needed to. And I'm, I'm pretty used to that. I, I don't know that I ever had a whole fifth grade class that was ever on fifth grade level. And I think that once we get into those testing grades, we're so fast, the pace is ridiculous. And she's told me, you know, there were so many kids in her class that were misbehaving all the time. Um, she felt like her teachers had to spend more time, um, you know, with behavior. This, this is coming from her more, you know, focusing more on behavior than being able to teach class. And so right now I'm just trying to create an atmosphere of very relaxed, um, of just finding what they like to learn about and um, put a little joy in that. So it's not, it's not too hard with my younger ones, but with her, it's pretty, it's pretty intense. Yeah. You got to undo some things to yes. start. And, you know, I, I'm a, I'm a guy, I, I actually, I like data. I like looking at assessments and, but I, I hate what the testing in, environment has done to schools. Like you just said, mm -hmm. I think it, this is a, another case of um, good intentions gone completely awry. You know, mm -hmm. using a test to, to truly measure progress and to help us figure out where we're going to go and adjust is one thing. But when an entire school day and 180 school days in a year all revolve around one singular test, it's, it's a problem because mm -hmm. we end up doing things that nobody wants to do. The kids don't like it. The teachers don't like it. This pace of just, let's just start flying through quote unquote curriculum just so we can say we covered it all so that we can continue to get the same results on a stupid test. It just, it doesn't do anybody any good. And in fact, we end up with people moving 2000 miles away who say, I'm just going to homeschool my entire family. <laughs> I mean, it, that's, that's crazy. It's absolutely crazy. So kudos to you for, for taking a stand and saying, you know, let, let's just get a fresh start. These, these are my kids and I'm going to take control. I'm going to take ownership of them. And if, like you said, if, if you can't do it, who can really? Mm -hmm. um, and that, that's powerful. That's powerful. So when you say you're trying to take this more relaxed approach, um, what, what does that look like on an, any given day? Are your kids in school for seven hours a day, sitting behind desks, raising their hand to speak and use the bathroom, or is it more organic? Oh, it's very organic. And um, they are so used to a routine. They kind of get on to me about that. And I'm used to a routine too, but you know, I don't want to have a routine all the time. I want there to be a lot of flexibility. I want it to be more organic. I like that you said that. Uh, so one thing that also drives our schooling are grades. Yeah. And so something that breaks down, like whenever we do math, I'm going to use math as an example, because I think that's my biggest hurdle right now is trying to help my oldest in math. Um, so she gets, oh, I don't want to like, you know, if she ever listens to this. I don't want her to be embarrassed, but, let, but it's, it's pretty intense. The math lessons are intense and just trying to get her not to worry about the grading of it, yeah. but just the process down um, is, is my approach. And I want her to find joy in learning math because I think, that once you kind of figure out how it all works, it is fun. It's kind of like puzzles. And I want her to experience that. So I'm just learning how they like to learn. And I feel like once I go back into the public school system, because I have, you know, a varied group of kids at this point, you know, from fifth grade, third grade, uh, first grade, and preschool, I, I'm going to be able to learn so much from them and then put that back into the classroom. And something I learned from my oldest is that if she is just listening to music while she's doing her math, it completely relaxes her. Mm. And that makes me think, you know, yesterday we had no breakdowns, we had no tears, we had no, you know, angry, you know, oh, I have to do math again. It was not like that. And because I've just let her listen to her music and that's all she really wants to do. And she figured it out. I, I, I took a picture of her, she was like taking her own notes. It was a miracle. I was like, thank you, Jesus, this is amazing. Right. And, you know, and that's what I want for her. And my son doesn't struggle at all all in math or anything like that he's just like we just do whatever he wants I just put books in front of him try to see what he's interested in uh, and my my first grader so I taught first grade in the public school last year and she as a third child and I was a third child so I could actually say that sometimes third children can get a little ignored listen I don't know who your third child is Dr. Dave but you know yeah, yeah. <laughs> pay attention to your third pay attention to your third so um so I she has actually blown me away. She's, 
she's a great reader and we have just sat there we just read chapter books and it's so funny to hear her say but i can't read because i'll pull out a chapter book that's you know like amelia bedelia it's it's you know appropriate for her right. age and she i can't read that and i'm like really well let's just try you know and then she, of course she's she just takes off with it and um it, it just it's amazing for me to see my child do that and i i feel very grateful that i have the opportunity to see my kids do this because when we were when in texas when i was working in the public school system i would come home i would be way too tired to help with homework i was exhausted my husband was exhausted and um, there really was no joy at the end of the day but now there's like joy in our day and it doesn't take a long time because when you're working one-on-one -on -one with a child you get through everything we put a lot of stuff together. We put math and science together, social studies and reading. Like I, I'm, I've always done that in the classroom. I try to put as much together as I could. And I feel that it's very appropriate now that we're in this environment. And um, one of my goals is also to explore the, oh, it's hard to say, the Native American um, Indigenous museums. Yes. yes, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, that's one of my goals this year. That's cool. So you're making it totally relevant. And you made me think about something when you're talking about your oldest, especially. I heard this study recently and I haven't verified it, but I'm going to throw it out there as though it's fact. The rest of you, you go, go do your fact checking. But the largest growing sector of employment in America today is stay at home jobs. So people that are able to work from home. And, you know, if the purpose of school really is to prepare people for life outside of school, college and career ready, it might be time for us to start embracing the fact that our kids need to learn how to schedule themselves at home, have this flexibility, just get the job done no matter when it's happening, whether it's at night, in your room, headphones on. I mean, you might be onto something here. You might truly be helping prepare your five kids for the careers they're going to have just by changing their environment. Yeah, well, I appreciate that. I know um, we talk about like, what do they want to do? And I know they're all going to scatter to the ends of the earth. And I feel like I'm reaping what I sowed because I both my husband and I, we just left home as soon as we could. We moved different states away from our families. So I feel like our kids are just going to do that too. But they're, they're more global. And because I am global now, and my oldest is with me all the time. She sees everything I do. She listens to everything that I'm listening to. And she's like, I'm going to be in Australia. She's going to be a biologist or whatever in Australia. And I believe, I totally believe she's going to do it. That's so awesome. I'm excited for her. That's yeah. awesome. That's awesome. So I, I want to get back now to Alaska. <laughs> this is so fascinating to me. So did you guys <laughs> literally just throw out a map and like throw a dart and say, let's go? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, I know there was a lot of stuff that led into the decision to leave, but what was it about Alaska that drew you there? And what's been the biggest, holy crap, culture shock oh. you've had? There's had I'm sure there's been hundreds. Lots of them. So, okay. Um, and in July of 2018, my husband had um, quadruple bypass surgery. Yeah. Uh, it was emergency. It was not expected. And he was contracting at that time. And because it takes months to recover from that, he basically, they, they were able to legally like kind of let him go. And so th basically we were on my income as a teacher and um, while well, he was searching and recovering uh, and we were just, that's, that's huge. I mean, I went back to that school year, last school year with him recovering from that. It was a horrible summer already on top of a few years of craziness. And you know, it's just when two parents work in a household, when you have a lot of kids, especially, uh, and there's a lot of needs, definitely needs are not met. And so that's something that was always weighing on me. And when he, start, when he was able to go back to work last October, every job in his field was out of state. So we were looking at Utah, we were looking at um, uh, Colorado, we were look, and then Alaska. And so he was just putting out his resume to everything, interviewing, interviewing, and, um, and we started thinking about Alaska. It was just, it just seemed so crazy. Like it might just be something really cool to do. And we actually, we, we are believers. So we started praying intensely about it. And so it was not a decision that we took lightly. And then when it came down to it, um, two, two of two, he had two offers, one in Denver two, two offers. and then one in, um, Anchorage. Anchorage. Can, is, can you hear me? Can you hear me? I can hear you just fine. Yeah. Okay, great. Okay, great. And so I just, so told, I him, just told him, make the, make the decision that is best for your health and the best for our family's health. 
um, because it's, it's really on you at this point. You're the one that has to fulfill the contract obligations. And he is the breadwinner. You know, uh, we weren't going to survive on my salary. So I did, it was, we were going to have to leave. There was nothing local for us there. And so he definitely um, thought about it, you know, which is crazy. Denver offered more money, but we were just going to be exchanging one rat race for another. Just the same kind of commute, the same long hours. And so he did choose Anchorage because it really is more slow paced here. Um, and that is true. It's, it's much slower here. People are different here. My kids play outside like you and I did when we were growing up. They, wow. All three of them, only um, one of them was riding a bike when we first moved here. Um, all th oh, actually four. Now four out of the five are riding bikes. Only one in training wheels still. Um, there's a little park where we are and they're friends with the neighbors. The neighbors, you know, they play in our little duplex. They don't care that it's tiny. And it's just, it's like we went back in time. So that to me is, is mind blowing because in Texas, you know, we just, we just didn't do that. You didn't let your kids go out. We lived by a busy street. Our backyard was tiny and there was just, it was just, it's, that was a culture shock and it was a good one. All right. Um, the, oh crap, I can't believe I'm here, um, is not being connected with family and friends. I feel like I spend a lot more time on social media now because that connection that I had when I was, you know, living in the same place for 20 years, all those relationships that I had, they were right there. But now I feel, um, I feel that loss of connection. That's probably the hardest thing to deal with overall. And I know that once I get back into work or, you know, I can, um, I'll get those connections again, but, but that's probably the hardest thing to deal with at this point. And also the winter is coming. That's also <laughs> very hard. <laughs> <laughs> the clock is ticking for sure for sure yeah that's um yeah I, I'm not, we're not going to go there let's try to stay in the positive here let's stay hopeful and optimistic that this is a move that was good for you and your family but so I, I want to I do want to stay on that though um thinking about you and you said that your oldest is watching your every move mm -hmm. and is with you all the time listening to everything that you're listening to seeing everything that you see um, and inevitably probably modeling a lot of your behaviors, your emotions. And so that's got to cause extra stress for you as well as you're always trying to <laughs> be upbeat and positive and optimistic and hopeful, even when <sighs> those dark days come and you're feeling like you just want to lose it all. When you're thinking about the fact that you are homeschooling, do you see that as part of your school experience that you're giving them? Not just the academics and the reading, writing, math, social, but like you're teaching them some other bigger life skills in this process. So, if so what, what is it that you're trying to instill? Right. Um, so I want them to see, I want them to see that, you know, learning is amazing. Connecting with people is amazing. Uh, that there's joy. Like I read all the time. I love having books um, and I want them to see me reading. I write all the time. I want them to see me writing. And so that it's not such a struggle when I want them to do the same thing. And I want it to be meaningful. I, I don't have to do anything fluffy because nobody's looking over me. Um, I don't have to, I mean, we can do everything that we want. We are not limited. And so, um, and everything is so connected. That's what I want for them. I want them to see that, uh, that there's purpose in what we're learning and that we're putting it to, to real life. Um, I'm losing my words, but I want them no, to know that it's, it's this just, is like there's real no life. Relevance, there's no point, right? And, right. I mean, as we were talking before we went on, your, your kids are out looking at mountains right now. I mean, right, right, <laughs> how right. amazing is that? That, okay, let's, let's just go with that. We're going to go stare at some mountains for a little while. And that yeah. is learning in its truest form right there. Right. I mean, there's no way you can do that in Texas. In Texas, it's let's go look at another big field. I mean, what, <laughs> right? I mean, it is really amazing. And they, my husband and my children, they're outdoorsy. Uh, they, they cannot wait for it to be covered in snow and they are not afraid of heights. Like there is no fear. And so they are amazing. I just watch them and I have a lot of fear and I don't like heights. And every time we go to the mountain, I sometimes get out of the, um, the Tahoe and sometimes I just stay and watch them because it's, it, it's not the same for me. Although I don't want to transfer my fear to them, but I'm okay because my husband has no fear. So they just, they take after him. But yeah, that's, it is amazing for them to see those mountains. When we first got here, um, and it, 
course, when I woke up, I thought it was really early in the morning, but it was almost 11 o'clock in the day and um, it, it was still kind of dark. But when we started driving to Eagle River and he said, and my husband was like, look out the windows. And it, for the, when I noticed all those mountains around us, it was just like, wow. it just took my breath away. I had never seen anything like it. I've been to, you know, the Appalachian, I've been to the Rockies, but it's just incredible here. It's, it's even, it, yeah, every time we go somewhere and we are kind of landlocked, we don't get to go. In, uh, in Texas, we could drive wherever we want in any state, but yeah, we're, it's crazy big here, but it's amazing. You know, all of the wildlife, we've got to see moose, we've got to see bear. Um, I've only seen one live bear, so I, can, I can't use That's the point. plenty. Check, <laughs> check that off the list, you're good. <laughs> I don't know that you need to see more than that. <laughs> yeah, but it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty amazing. That's awesome, that's awesome. Well, I'm gonna, I, I will venture to say, you do have some bravery as well, you know? The fact that you literally moved thousands of miles away without truly being in control. You said that your husband is really like the breadwinner, which, and mm -hmm. he was the one that, that probably helped initiate a lot of this, the decision making. And you went with that. that. That leap of faith is a brave, brave move. You know, don't, don't sell yourself short on that. That is huge. And the fact that you are, again, whew, homeschooling five kids yeah. you, <laughs> is insanely brave. That's crazy. And you also are working with, with EduMatch doing some crazy cool stuff with that. And we haven't even touched on that yet. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just like you're, you're involved in so, so much. So let's talk EduMatch. And it, along with that, the fact that you've got a book coming out. Right. So talk, talk about EduMatch. First of all, what is your role within EduMatch? So I'm a logistics manager and it's kind of cool. Um, so I helped write one chapter of Mandy Freilich's book, The Fire Within. And so that's how I got to know her. And through her, when she found out I was moving to Alaska, I don't know if that kind of helped, but they, need, they, were, they needed somebody to fulfill the logistics part of it. And so my name was thrown in there. And I, I kind of knew Sarah um, a little bit, Dr. Sarah Thomas. I knew her just a little bit. And so uh, we talked about it. It seemed like it was gonna work. It's stuff that I can do at home. It wasn't gonna be long hours by any means. And um, so just little by little, I've been learning how to help, you know, the, the different authors that are putting their books out. So we created the, the community on Facebook this last summer. And, um, and so that's probably what I enjoy more than anything. And I just put out different posts on, uh, you know, the, the social media accounts that we have. But, and then of course, I'm involved in the Voxer group with all of our EduMatch authors. So I guess the things that I really love about being part of EduMatch is just that it really is like family. And so many of these authors I've never met in my life, but we're connected and we're just, you know, like all the book launches that are happening, just the amazing support that's with that is, it just, it blows me away every single time. And I love being a part of an educator group that lifts people up. That's why I like your podcast when we can encourage people and amplify their voices, I think that's the most important thing because that's what we want to do for our students. And I love being able to do that with other educators who are trying to make a real difference. And so being a part of the EduMatch family is, I, I just, yeah, sometimes I can't even believe that I get to do this. It's pretty cool. And, so it, you know, and you know, it, it is really easy to boost educators up because educators are good, good people. You know, there's a lot of talk about schools being broken and there's part of me that, that believes a lot of that but it's not it's not the people it there are the systems and the practices and the policies and the antiquated approaches that we use but the people within sometimes we do just need to help light that fire and empower them and make them realize that they can truly i mean if if you can move a couple thousand miles away and bring your five kids home with you to <laughs> educate them we can do anything to help educate kids um it, we can't let the system or the way it's always been done limit our possibilities for kids. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, and I, I think that your voice right now is amplifying that message loud and clear to a lot of people. So within EduMatch, you know, you say you're, you're basically like the connector. You're bringing all these people together and helping, helping them stay organized and making sure things are happening on a, on a deadline. And now you've got your own in the pipeline. Talk about that. How cool is that? Well, thank you. So I actually wrote this story about uh, 10 years ago. I was pregnant with my first kid um, and I was a fifth grade teacher. And I thought, you know, this book has been swimming in my mind forever and I just need to get it out. And I didn't even know at the time if, if it would just be something that I just read to my students or if it would ever, because at that time things didn't seem so connected. I had no idea uh, 
it's just, it's just changed so dramatically in the last decade, you know? Yeah. And um, so I, I just put this story out and I've read it to every single one of my fifth grade classes. I, um, I one of my fourth grade classes and even last year to my first graders. And I, I wanted to see like if, if it resonated with them. So it's called the I'm sorry story. And one thing I noticed when I started teaching is that kids do not know how to make it, how to like when they do something wrong to another kid, um, they don't know how to like come back together in a way that is healthy. And yeah. they just throw out like, sorry, sorry. And you know, they don't mean it. They have no idea. The empathy part is always missing. It really is something that we have to teach them. And so this story was just like, how to do that, how to make it right, how to take ownership. That was another big thing in the fifth grade and probably middle school ages is taking ownership. I did wrong. I have to own it. You know, I mean, it's hard for adults to do that. And um, probably, you know, they didn't get taught. I don't know. But just <laughs> but that's a huge piece of my story is helping um, the, the main character taking ownership of uh, just the things that he does wrong you know, that hurts other people and then just making it right. How can you make it right? And how can you restore relationships? And it's called the I'm sorry story. And, um, because sorry is a word we hear all the time. And, um, I, yeah, I, I, I know what it's like when people throw the word at you and they don't mean it at all and how hurtful that can be too. And so I just wanted that to be, and, um, a part of it. And so I've read this story to, like I said, all of my classes and they always were just like, how did you know all of that? <laughs> wow. How, you know, so it really did resonate with them. Actually having it published is really scary. And you know this, when you write something and then you put it out for everybody else to see, that is so scary. So I'm kind of like, oh my gosh. Now, I mean, I, I hope- that, those, You want everybody to know about it, but you don't really want it, you know? <laughs> yeah, I, I get yeah. it. Yeah, wow. it's like, but hey, and- um. So, and, and probably being a part of the fire within with Mandy Freilich, um, I was able to talk with her about the story and she got me connected really quickly with, um, you know, Dr. Sarah and uh, it just, it all just started coming together. My illustrator is a, co a coworker that is one of my close friends also. And so being able to see her go into a new role cause she's an artist, she's amazing. That's been pretty awesome too, to work with her. Cause she really that's believed cool. in the story. Yeah. That's awesome. You, Thanks. you you're, you're inspiring me right now. It, truly, you're, you're this woman that just takes these giant leaps of faith. You know, there's, there's one thing for, for people to make sure that they have all their ducks in a row and they, they take these very strategic steps and God bless them for going and making it big when they, can, when they can stack all those things in order. It's something else when somebody just says, you know, I'm just going to take a step. We'll see where right. it goes. I'm going to take another step, see where it goes. And then you look back and you're like, oh my gosh, look how far I came. And that's, that's you right now. I'm just... I'm in awe and I'm, I'm oh, super, thank you. super impressed with you. It's your, oh, your, thanks. Your life. <laughs> well, thank you. I mean, there is so much opportunity out there. I mean, there's opportunity for every single person that wants to grab it and I grab it. Yeah. I just, you know, and I do, I do believe that my faith is a big part of that. And, um, it, I feel amazed sometimes like, how did I get all these opportunities? How do I get connect? How am I connected? How am I like, I'm like, how is, like nobody knows Melody. How, is she, how, am, how have I been connected with all of these amazing rock stars like you? You know, I mean, it just came all about, and I am just like, sometimes I even think, wow, this is, a, this is a crazy, awesome life. And really it just goes back to when there's opportunity thrown out there, take it, just jump at yeah. it. And that's always what I've done. Ride it as long as you can. I mean, you talk about faith and faith, whether, whether people believe what, what you believe or not, faith is simply believing in something that you you don't have evidence for you, mm -hmm. you don't know you don't know all the details but you're willing to take that chance and that's something that we we all need to embrace it's right. just you've got to be willing to take chances you know it we talk about this all the time in schools and maybe this is really what we need to be teaching to our kids in schools not necessarily we don't need to teach failure we need to teach faith we need to teach go take a chance and see what happens that's what i love about. that yes I'm going to yes, bring it back. Faith yes. the schools. Faith <laughs> the public schools. <laughs> All right. I, think, I, I think there's a lot of faith in public schools. And I think that's the best part of our public school system is our, are the people that are working in it and a lot of crazy, like you said, antiquated systems that, yeah. you know, but, but we're pushing it and we're breaking those systems down. And I think, I think there's already a lot of faith right there. There you go. That's awesome. That's awesome. So, 
you know, the fact you've, you've now been in a couple of places, you worked um, in a, a, with a lot of different kids. Um, and we talk about breaking down some systems aside from testing and trying to remove all of the, the pressures associated with that. Testing's not going anywhere, but right. our playing the game of testing probably can be shoved to the side by any, any of us at any time. What else do you think we really need to be focusing in on to, to try to improve the life of our kids? Right. So um, one of the things that I'm very passionate about in the school system and what I'm learning about. So please know that I'm not an expert in any way, shape or form, but I am a passionate learner just about like restorative justice and, you know, bringing equity for all kids in education, especially our black and brown kids. I think that is um, so important. And if we really if we really think about how the public school system amplifies the entire society that you and I operate in and how reflective they both are. And um, even, you know, the housing, the prison system, it, it all goes together. And I think yeah. the worst part of our system is like the punitive part. We, we do this with our students and that's where the joy is stolen. And then we, we have also this punitive relationship between teachers and admin. And then, you know, uh, the admin and then their um, supervisor. So there's all this punitive, um, that goes with it. Um, and I just, I think those are the areas that we need to learn more about and break them down. And if we can embrace like the fact that we don't have all the answers, but we're willing to learn and that there are perspectives out there uh, from people that are, that don't look like you and me, um, but there are perspectives that we are not always embracing and that we should be. I think that needs to be a part of like teacher training. And for those of us that have already been a part of teaching for many years, it, it needs to be something that is always a part of like our professional development. And um, so that's, that's really important to me. And I also put that in my book, like, all the characters in my book, the main character is not a white character. Like everything that I believe in my heart is put into my book because I want every child to be able to read that and feel like he or she is represented. And so that was something that my illustrator and I tried really hard um, to, to put in place. So it, yeah, but that's, that's so what I'm really passionate. That's so good. I could have used that speech personally, honestly, 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when, when I first started in, in education, I thought my job was to be the expert, to know it all, and know all for my kids and to know it all in my hallway and in my building. When parents would contact me, I had to know it all. I had to be the expert of all things. And I think a lot of people spend their entire careers that way. I think a lot of our building administrators behave that way. They were elevated to their position because of their job they did um, in the classroom. So they think now everybody just needs to simply do things their way. Um, and it just, it, that, it perpetuates this broken system where we continue to have the same people, same beliefs, same mindsets saying, just keep, keep the status quo, keep doing it our way. And then other people with other mindsets and other points of view never get listened to because that door is never open for them. So again, kudos to you for trying to open those doors and to say, let in other voices, um, mm -hmm. let other people have a seat at the table, let other people have an opportunity to, to change things how they need to be changed for them, not just for us. So good for you. Good for you. Hey, thanks. Good for you yeah. too. I, I needed it too. When I first started teaching, I had no idea what I didn't know. Yeah, it's the truth. That's the truth. So good. So let's, let's just segue now to the big question. You know, I, I warned you this question was coming because right. this podcast <laughs> is so big and so popular. I use this every single time that you can educate a few billion people around right. the planet you get the opportunity to close this out with a mic drop moment here. So right. 30 seconds, might be 30 minutes, might be 10 seconds. But I say 30 seconds is our target for you to drop it, to just say, here's what the world needs now. Here's what educators need. Here's what kids need. It's your opportunity, your platform speech. And I'm dragging this out so you can continue to think right, about right. it. Right, right. And I am. I'm thinking about it. So, <laughs> <laughs> so you got 30 seconds here. Drop that mic and tell the world what we need. Go. Right. All right, so that's a lot of pressure, but I, I'm gonna I'm gonna rise I'm gonna rise to it. So Dick, I think that every Dick, educator Dick, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I wish that every educator that's listening or every anybody from what wherever um, walk of life that they're coming from, just one thing is to really listen to what brings you joy and pursue that, and um, and find a way to connect with other people, people that are gonna lift you up, and um, people that you can 
lift up to. I mean, it's, it's all about how we relate to one another. And then put that back into your classroom with your students. How are you going to give them their voice, or not give them their voice, but how are you going to help them find their voice and then and broadcast that voice? Because I think we're missing that so much. Uh, I heard a, a child on your uh, podcast say that he just wanted more people to be nice. He wanted teachers to be nice and he wanted the kids to be nice. And sometimes we just need to go back and talk to our kids and figure out what they really want, what drives them. And we also have to do that inside of ourselves. What is driving us? And, and, and to always lift each other up and get out of our classrooms like it, it's popular right now. We're not in a silo business. You know, we have to have each other and, um, and connect and just pull each other up if we can do that for each other, then we bring it back to our classrooms, and that's where all this community is starting to transform. And then that goes outside of our classrooms and starts yeah. transforming the community that we live in, which also will, in my maybe naivety or my hopes and dreams, I just want to be more connected to my community locally and globally. And I think that's kind of the direction that we should be going in. So. Absolutely. No, that was good. Absolutely. It's, it's, the, it's the idea that the next generation doesn't stand a chance if our generation can't change. Our generation right. has to change to lead the next generation because they're following our every example. They're following our moves. They're looking to us to say, how do I navigate this thing called life? And unless we're willing to collaborate, unless we're willing to open those doors and listen in to other people and not scream and yell and bark, but truly amplify the voices of the people you disagree with. Right. And, and put them out there and say, mm -hmm. let's have a conversation now. It's our, our kids don't stand a chance. So we can't keep looking down and saying the next generation is going to change everything. It's on us. Step up and own it. So right. I, think, I think you just did that. That was awesome. You dropped the mic. Hey, thanks. Thank you. <laughs> I, I want to say what you just said, being able to talk with people that have the difference of opinion than you. I think that is something that's so lost right now. And we right. as educators, we need to bring that back because we should be able to converse with people that are different than us and, and still like them, still find some sort of um, treasure in them that they have, some gem that they have. So, no, it's so good. You know, a, a few weeks ago, I, I had Jeff Gargas on. I don't know if you know, if you're familiar with him, the Teach Better team. And he, mm -hmm. he his mm -hmm. followers are just like, exponentially growing but he he carries a belief that he does not block or mute anybody he wants to hear those voices he wants to hear those people that completely disagree with everything he's saying because it helps sharpen his saw not so that he can debate and fight them but he needs to hear their perspective if you don't have anybody challenging your perspective you just live like blindly and you're right. not questioning yourself so i think i think it's so real and so important that we all open our ears and our eyes whether it's to other adults or to the kids in front of us, because they will tell you the truth. <laughs> so we just right, have to listen. Right, right, right. So good, so good. Well, Melody, I wanna thank you again for, uh, for being here tonight, for enlightening me to what life is like in Alaska. I know that's on a lot of people's bucket lists to be there and go there. They can act like they've been there now. They can, because <laughs> you've been in the picture for us all. So I appreciate that. Thank you for, sitting there with smiles on your face, although I know you educate five kids at home every day, um, and you're still awake and smiling and happy and spunky and optimistic and truly just embracing anything life throws at you. You're just, you're a rock star and you're killing it. So thank you so much for being here. Hey, thank you. I really appreciate it. This was a great experience. I really, I do. I feel um, very uplifted and encouraged. So thank you. That's awesome. You're, you're, you're inspiring everybody. So thank you.